God didn't create us all the same. Think about that statement. God created us all equal, all the same. No, he did not. No way. People say you just got to have a lot of passion. You can do whatever you want. Not true. You got to find out what you love to do and what you could be good at. You may not be great at it yet, but if I mm. work, this is what my makeup is driving me to do. And now I pour passion into that and persistence. Now you're going to kill it. Instead of just, you can do whatever you set your mind to. God created us all equal. No, he did not. Right. And that's a whole conversation in and of itself. It's when you find, what am I good at? What do I love to do? What do I enjoy? And then you go after that. And that's what you pour your soul into and your passion into. That's the definition of success. All right. So, not sure what episode this is. I think it's 32. Be my guess, 31, 32. Yep. But we got Dr. Steve Judson on the show. Um, he's got a lot of stuff to share. I'm going to let him introduce himself, but uh, to give you the quick synopsis on why he's here, uh, you know, the most pivotal conversation I've had in terms of what has brought me to even in this room right now has been the conversation we had at the diner that one morning. So it was about two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago where you and I met up, I had asked you, I wanted to just pick your brain. And I met Steve at uh, Olympia Diner on the on the turnpike. And uh, we had talked for like two hours. And at the end, the thing that you said, you were like, listen, man, you know, if this is what you want to pursue with the whole coaching thing and the whole psychology thing, you got to get on TikTok, you got to get on these apps, you got to start creating content around the things that you're passionate about. And then, you know, once you can get disciplined with that, then take it from there. But that was basically the thing that you said was like, get consistent with content. And then let the road show you where you need to go. And I did. And like, that was like the first time where I was like super, I don't want to say against the grain, but it was like, nobody else was doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you were the facilitator for that. And that's what led me to come to college and live on campus. That's what led me to meet Cal, who I started a business with. That's what led me to be in this room. Like, so to me, it's like, that's where the domino started falling and, and people don't understand that. Um, so, you know, first of all, I appreciate you for that. I know I've said that a million times, but for real, thank you. My pleasure, pal. Uh, but you know, our relationship has developed over the, over the past couple of years through that. And, uh, you've been really pivotal in terms of my, you know, development in terms of being a mentor mm -hmm. in that aspect. But, uh, for the listeners, that's why you're here. And that's why we met. And uh, yeah, who is Dr. Steve Judson? <laughs> that's that's an open-ended question. I wear many hats. Yeah. Uh, the, the, my, my biggest pride and joy is my family. I've got five kids and an awesome wife. You know, we've been married over 22 years. And to me, that's the biggest business you'll ever start and keep running. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, to me, that's the ultimate legacy that I had to make a decision on many years ago. By trade, I'm a chiropractor. Uh, I've got six offices right now. I've got a partner, Dr. Michael Coster, that we've uh, created this whole vision um, within the chiropractic realm, which is pretty awesome. I'm an author, authored three books, co-authored three other books, uh, motivational speaker. I've spoken around the world, big groups, and a mentor, coach. I, I, you know, I consult guys who are uh, trying to create what I've created and uh, we talk on a weekly basis or bi-monthly basis and, and just jam on life and, and how they could grow. And just, uh, you know, it's when you when you wake up in a position I'm in, you have a, an ability to help people get there faster if they really want it. Definitely. So you made a comment a couple times in, in the intro that people just don't know. Yeah. Where they don't get it. Um, people don't know what they don't know. Right. And uh, if we could be, create a path to, reach out to people, which is why what I love what you did is you took massive action. Yeah. The first step was reaching out and saying, Hey, let's, let's break bread. Let's just have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I'll do that with anybody. Right. Um, and then when you learn someone's story and kind of see what they're looking to do, you know, as people, you can't be perfectionist in life. It's just doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, I woke up one day and I saw your shit online, man, and it was blowing up. And yeah. I'm like, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. It was so funny. You know, I was like, I was a I was approaching the 100,000 followers mark. And every day I got closer and closer and closer. And I was like, I just can't wait to text Mr. Judson. I just needed, I couldn't wait. And I remember that morning I was up at like five at the gym. And then I texted you. I was like, I looked at my phone and I was at 100K. I was like, let's go. Right. And so then so I texted you. And then I got banned. But that's the story for another day. But that's that's yeah. all right. I mean, it's yeah. what you learned along the way, and they'll right. just they could ban us all, us, but they'll never shut us down. Right. Hundred you know, percent. Go ahead. I'm us. curious to know why you use the um, the business metaphor for family. 
He said, family's the biggest business you'll ever run. Well, there's, there's no perfect book on how to do it. Yeah. And uh, there's many, you know, it's, it's financial. Mm. It's emotional. Um, it has to operate out of love, which is a tough term for people to understand. Uh, love is, is an open-ended, you know, sometimes love is, it's got some anger. You know, you hurt one of my kids. I love them so much. I'm going to protect them. Mm. Um, but, you know, you're dealing, especially as men, like real men, we're a bunch of animals. Yeah. You know, we're, we're hunters and gatherers and, you know, fighters and creators and just need challenges. And we like change and shift. And when you get into the life of marriage, some of that gets suppressed and it has to, mm. uh, to create a successful marriage. You know, so to me, it's like I, I had to look back at it as almost like a business and setting up systems and covenants within yourselves and things, directions you would not step into because that's not my business, right? Right. And what am I really good at and I'm going to focus on and pour my energy into to create? So it's just something, a process I put in my brain to realize, wow, it's it's like having another business because, you know, at this point now I've built multiple businesses. You know, I've got... I think seven businesses right now, eight biz different styles. Um, and they all follow the same principles. And marriage is a tough one because, you know, as a man, you go out in the world and you're a businessman, you got a guy who shows up, he could be an executive or, you know, working in a warehouse and he has to show up and sh put his best face and foot forward. Mm. You can't suck. You'll get fired or you won't get a raise and your life's going to change fast. So if you're having a tough day, you got to hide it, but you don't have to hide it at home. I mean, your spouse and kids will see you at your worst and um, because you're comfortable there and you figured, well, they love me. They'll suck it up. Um, so I realized that and I saw a lot of very successful men screw their kids up uh, because they went off the road at home and they, and they, you know, it's one thing to have a bad day at home, but there's another one to have a really bad day at home. Mm -hmm. And if your kids are young and they're seeing this stuff and you're impacting their lives forever and you could... You know, that's why I wrote the book, The Backpack. I've had thousands of patients where a lot of their suffering was coming from their past emotions and experiences, and a lot of times it was from their home life. And they're carrying that shit around, and it's slowing them down in their progress in life. So they have to stop and realize that wasn't their fault. That was their parents' stuff. They got to release it to be able to go on and live the life they want. Mm. Now, what's the difference? Because you, 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 my the first thing that came to my mind when you said – you know, you have to release some of those, you know, I don't want to directly quote, misquote you, but you said you have to release some of those manly desires or manly drives when yeah. you get married. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what you said, but what's the difference between that when you get married or when you get into just a relationship pre-marriage? Because a relationship is relatively short term mm -hmm. and there's no full commitment. There's always, the back door is always open. Right. Once you put the ring on your finger, man, that's one. That's the biggest step you'll make in your life. And it's and it's you know I I joke when I tell my kids this and you know young guys that come to me that are looking to get married, I ask them what's your favorite ice cream. Mine's coffee ice cream. Yeah. But every now and then I want something different. You know I'll get the vanilla swirl. I'll get you know different things. Well now I'm saying you can only have vanilla. You can only have coffee ice cream for the rest of your life. Once that that once that rings on you, that's all you're eating coffee ice cream you may have desires to go into that ice cream shop and mix it up a little bit but you're going to screw your life up you're going to screw your family up you're going to screw a lot of things up and it's against principle so just don't eat the other ice cream right. so to me that's what that that ultimate commitment comes down to is mm -hmm. you're going to want other ice cream right. when you're married there's nothing wrong with that that's human desire you just got to know going into the game and make a, a pact with yourself it's off limits what did that look like for you? You know, for for me, it was just, it was never an option. You know, it, you, you get quiet. You know, I've got four daughters and a son. And I would think about what if, what if I veered? And then they always find out. Right. It always comes out. Everything I taught them in life to that point and, you know, all the looking up they do to you and everything is wiped off the table real fast. Mm. And would I be able to rebuild that, you know, and that pain, you know, there's pain and pleasure. There'll be pleasure in, in that moment of veering off, no doubt, but the pain of ruining your relationship and the memories, I mean, man, the memories, 
I think me and my wife, just watching every one of my kids get born and delivered and filling up with tears and emotion and holding them and then fucking it up 10, 15, 20 years later for a moment. Why? You know, and then all the memories of them riding the bike for the first time, throwing their first baseball, scoring their first goal, uh, struggling, up at night crying, crawling in the bed with you. You'll never get that stuff back. And as a, as a human being, that to me would be the greatest. I've built that up to be one of my greatest painful experiences just to be able to say no. And, you know, there's always desires. You know, women are always going to check out other men and men are always going to check out other women. You just don't be a dirtbag about it. It's just human nature. You know, it's chemistry. Mm. And uh, I think it's just we can't fear that. Mm -hmm. We can't demean that. We just got to realize by trade we're animals, man. Right. And society's become really soft and they're really just making men into a bunch of saps and just uh, live a sap life. And I think women need to realize, no, we're meant, we're, we're majority of us, are, you know, should be shooting guns, lifting weights, conquering loving our wife, making love to our wife. Um, but, you know, take out the damn garbage. You know, it's not chores around your house. You're part of a team member. Hug your wife. Rub her back just for the sake of rubbing her back. Um, be there. Uh, when they want to bitch you out for something and you want to lash back, don't. And I've done all that. I ain't perfect. Right. You know, I mean, I've done, I've done a lot of wrong. And because my yeah. wife's awesome, she didn't kick me to the curb. Right. You know, there were times I had to slip and check and just be like, don't be that guy. Because yeah. I think we all are to some extent. And when you just, when you're able to have the conversation and surround yourself, I've got a great group of dudes that I hang out with. And we talk about stuff like this. Yeah. Then you realize it's just not me. Yeah. And well, what do you do? How do you handle this? Mm. You know, there's a great book called The Five Love Languages. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm not reading that shit, man. Like, you know, yeah. I was reading all about growth and business and everything. And my wife said, I want you to read this. So there's a conference I speak at four times a year and it was coming up. She said, I want you to finish it before the seminar starts. And I said, okay. Well, that thing sat on my nightstand. I picked it up a couple times and I would read pages and I'm like, oh my God, this is like chick stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I was getting ready to board my plane and she said, you haven't read the book. And uh, she, I took the book with me, and I, I read through the whole thing on the flight. Two hours and 55 minutes. And when I got through the first couple chapters, it started kicking in, and I realized the greater scope it has in all areas of your life. And it's understanding people's needs and how they respond and how they communicate without speaking and how important it was for my wife to say, I want you to read this. Because, you know, for me, I'm a giver, right? I give... What, you know, if you need help, I'm there. If you need money, I'm there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give nice things. We had a beautiful home. We mm -hmm. had stuff. That wasn't her biggest concern. Her love language was touch, right? So just hug her. You know, instead of running out in the morning and I'm boogieing the work, love you, bye, and I'm out the door, stop, give her a hug. If we're at a party and there's people all around and you're talking to people and she's across the room, walk by, grab her ass, keep walking. Little shit like that, man, and, and she calls it filling her cup. And I had to put alerts on my phone to remind myself to do that because I'm not, ultimately was never a touchy-feely type of person. Right. So I had to work at it. I had to hold myself accountable. I had to talk to friends, be like, man, why is it so complicated? Why can't we just be happy? Because it's complicated. Right. You got to fill their cup. Right. You know? And me, I like words of affirmation. Every now and then, just say, hey, you're doing a good job. You okay? Mm. You need anything? You know, I don't need like accolades, right? But it's just because I'm a machine. I just go, right? Um, and you know, we've just built this system of support. That's you know, right now she's planning a trip to Key West, and I'm like, I, I need another plane ride. Like I need a hole in my head. You know, I'm flying every week, and um, it's complicated because I can't really miss the office. And she said, Well, can't you just take that week off? The kids are at school, blah blah blah. And I'm like, It's really tough right now. I said, I really shouldn't be going on this trip. And she said, But it's memories. We're creating memories with the kids. And she's right. Like, she's holding me accountable. You know, we're going lobster diving and stuff in Key West. It's like people live in Florida. That's what they do for their break. Mm. And I hate sharks, man. I don't need to jump off a boat in the middle <laughs> of nowhere. And, you <laughs> yeah. know, there's a lobster. I know there's a shark waiting there to eat that shit. And yeah. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to be. <laughs> but all, the kids are all going. And she's like, we're, you know, we're creating memories. Uh -huh. And she'll make it happen. And I just, instead of fighting it, you just say, okay. 
Mm. Cool. And I'm not a wuss for doing that. I'm just protecting my investment because I right. love her. Right. You know, I love her. And it's just, and I love my kids and I love what we've created. And I love the experiences we've had over the past 22 years. It's amazing. Mm. Now there's a big, you know, there's a million things I want to ask you, but the one that's pressing most is, you know, there's a big misconception, at least the way I view it is a misconception on, on the way people look at relationships as you know, you go out and you find the one and then everything's just fucking amazing. And that you just find that person and then things are just, they just click and you never have to work on anything and it's just perfect. And to me, you know, with the little wisdom that I have and knowledge of relationships that I have, the way that I look at it is like, you don't find the one. You find someone you think you're the most compatible with and then you create that one relationship. You create the one. And to me, it sounds like from the way that you're speaking about this is like, that's how it is. Because if your love language is in touch, or if you just want to go and fly out and work and work and work, but you don't want to go on any vacations, you got to figure out where you can help that relationship become the one where you can help your family become that family. Because it's not all about you. It's not all about what she wants. Because if, if you just married another you, then everything would just be perfectly aligned, but it's just not like that. And I don't think that anybody would want a life like that because it would all just be boring because you know what they think, you know what they want, you know how they want everything. You like, There's no spice to anything. And so to me, that, that simple fact alone creates this idea of you can't just find the perfect person and then everything's just perfect. Granted, there's a dichotomy there of you got to find a person that you know you are compatible with, but you have to drop this mystical idea of, you're just going to find this one person and you're never going to have another relationship problem ever again. You're never going to have another argument ever again. You're never going to have another slip up ever again. And that's the way I view it. And I'm curious to see what your two cents is on that. Well, there's a lot of things in there and you talk about becoming one, but you're never fully one. You're still going to be separate people mm. and you have to allow space for that. You got to allow. So Tammy just went to, to uh, Croatia and Greece. Her stepfather lives in Greece and she wanted me to go and he wants to see me, but it wasn't, the timing wasn't right. And it turned out to be great because she went by herself and she was able to read. And she said, I finished a 500 page book and she was able to go deep with it herself and experience herself because you don't want to lose yourself. A lot of people in marriage, they lose themselves in marriage because now they become mom and everything is just making the kids happy, making the husband happy, and they're exhausted. And then the kids and the husband are used to just mom doing everything, doing all the laundry, cooking, providing, booking, every, boom, 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 boom. And then the husband's just, well, I'm tired, and he's watching TV and watching golf or going golfing. And then he's tired, he goes to bed, and mom's laying there, and she wants to make love, and he's tired, right? And then you sit around with guys, and I've had this guy, I've heard this conversation too many times. Well, I haven't had sex in like six months, but huh, that's just marriage. And they're all agreeing. Like, we're well, a bunch of freaking losers. Like, you should be getting, making love, getting laid every day you're around that woman, right? Even if it's a quickie, she's brushing her teeth, go after it, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, that's, that's that human desire. Right. Women want to be sought after. Right. Again, they're animalistic too, man. And then there's the times they want to be wined and dined and may have the sweet little love. But there's other times it's just you just got to go into it and just take it over, man. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not dirty. It's not sinful. It's your freaking wife. And she wants that passion. And the guys to have this conversation, well, I'm not having sex because I'm, well, you're a loser, bro. Step up. It's your woman. Because what happens is these kids get old enough. They're going off to college. And now they look at each other like, who the hell are you? Mm. We don't know each other. We didn't do the trips. We didn't do the weekend getaways. We didn't sit down and talk. We didn't do date night. Mm. You know, we didn't uh, do a lot of things that just make the relationship better. Because you got to say, what's my outcome? I, t I tell people, no matter what conversation you get into, whatever relationship you get into, what's the outcome? Right? So the outcome is for me, I see myself being 80 years old, sitting at Thanksgiving dinner, with all my kids and grandkids and, you know, we're just, and I can look them all in the eye and say, we did it. We did it with principle. We did it the best we could. We had fun. We succeeded. We're all good. And then you step back and say, what do I have to do to make that happen today? One day at a time. One day at a time. And it's every little decision and communication that you have with that individual. I mean, dude, I studied what is love? I didn't believe in love at one time. I'm like, you know, you, you get a dog and the shit dies on your lap. I had my best buddy, McGee, of 13 years that was there for me emotionally a long time die on my lap. And um, 
You know, it's like, well, why buy another dog? You're just going to fall in love with the thing, be your buddy, and he's going to die because you enjoy the moments and the experience while it's there. And that that's what life is all about. So, you know, I tell people it's there's different levels of love, L-O-V-E. So one of my meditations, what came to me was love is L-O-V-E, life's only vital expression. Mm. So it's what's vital to just pump you through life. But sometimes love is a left hook is another <laughs> quote I'm known for. Which means if you're a friend of mine and I see you doing something, I love you enough to say that's stupid. Mm. You know, or you're thinking about doing something. No, that's wrong. Don't do that because I care enough. If I really don't care and it's a shallow relationship, yeah, I'm going to feed that demon inside of you. And I'm not that guy. My friends aren't that guy. You know, we have a tight, close circle. We travel the world together. You know, we get around each other. We're stupid. We're free, you know, but we're protected. We're cool, but then we plug back in and we're solid, man. But it's all about principle, mm -hmm. and we're never dishonest to our spouses. Our spouse is always with us 99% of the time, mm -hmm. and we're all in because, you know, one of the things I notice is you start to get a name and you start getting out there and you start getting successful, it's like there's a lot of opportunities to just go off the rails, and you can't do that. I mean, again, women are animals too. When they, they Especially in today's society, it's like you got these 50-year-old guys with these 22-year-old girls it's disgusting, man. And they'll think I'm like, a, you know, oh, who are you judging us? Whatever. I'm not judging. But you have a daughter? You want a dude coming along that age dating your daughter? You know it's not real. <sighs> so one of the cool things to study is soulmates. What is a soulmate? Mm. There's a great book called The Bridge Across Forever. Again, soft, sensitive. Like, I can't believe I read it. <laughs> you know, this guy Richard Bach has written amazing books. Yeah. And I really wanted to dive into it because my family fell apart because mm -hmm. of my parents' relationship, and it just destroyed a lot of stuff, and I had to unravel and heal from a lot of stuff, and I realized it was okay to hate certain things about my parents, but I love them for what they taught me not to do. See, a lot of times people want to, what did your parents teach you, and they did all this? Yeah, but what did they teach you not to do? And a lot of times it's look at and see what they did and realize that was their own weakness and their own past, and I'm not passing that on to my kids. And I got to work to change that in my life, and that's what's going to make your relationship freer with your wife, because... The majority of men aren't doing that. Right. You know, they're just falling into the nine to five. Marriage sucks. My wife's a pain in the ass. We don't have sex anymore. But that's marriage. Dude, that ain't marriage. And that shouldn't be marriage. Mm. Shit. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think they're, like, m why is most people's relationship, why do most people's relationships suck? Because, like, the, the sheer fact alone of, you understand that either it sucks in the way where you have to work on it and it's hard, so that sucks, or it sucks and you don't work on it and then it sucks because you have a shitty relationship. Why? Why do people? <coughs> why do people? Why? Why is that the norm? Why isn't the norm a happy, healthy relationship? Well, again, I don't know if I, if we could say most, right? Because it's like, how do we come to that number? I mean, from what we could see in front of us, mm. you know, we see our own hometown, man, and I called relationships falling apart years ago, and they're all falling apart. Mm. And I think it's just the decisions people make. And I think, you know, in life, you can't let yourself get bored. People need change. You know, they, they, they need to mix it up in life. And people just get caught up in the weekend. They're going to sit in their buddy's backyard and drink beers. And the ladies are going to sit inside and just drink whatever they're drinking. And then you, everyone goes home buzzed. And then you wake up hungover Sunday and you're back to work Monday to Friday. That's become the routine. You know, people have to have vision for their life what's their outcome why am i here what's my purpose who am i serving right and you don't have to be a millionaire to do that you could be making 50 grand a year and be the happiest person in the world and be saving yourself saving money have a system to save money get out of debt spend time with your kids spend time with your spouse um have a hobby let your spouse release you to go do your hobby whether it's hunting fishing golfing she has her hobbies, going off with the girls, takes a girl's trip somewhere and just goes off and has fun, and then we come back home and everything's good, and there's complete trust there. So I think people get complacent, and they think, well, this is the way they were raised, and this is how they're going to do it, and if they could have the conversation and say, how's that working for us? You know, Are people really happy? And I think that's where the truth is, no. We've become a bunch of sheep. 
We want people to make decisions for us. We want things to come easy. We want to pull up the drive throughs and just eat whatever comes out of that window instead of just earning our food. I mean, we don't have to hunt anymore. We never have to. Mm. Things are just given to us. Things are quick fixes. They're, and we're exposed to a lot more things that stimulate our brain in a negative way with all the social media stuff that we're not in reality anymore. Mm. You know, imagine if families just got rid of TVs. Stop reading the newspaper. <laughs> don't watch the news. That'd be the biggest step they can make. And I love having conversations with my kids and creating hard conversations, especially mm. as they've gotten older and conversations in the car I've had with them. And then it got awkward with when, especially with these young girls, would I'd pick them up from somewhere and they'd say, dad, can they talk to you? They have an issue with their boyfriend or someone and they didn't, couldn't talk to their own father. <sighs> so I'd have a conversation, go home and tell my wife, you need to call the mom and let her know this just happened yeah. because they need to know. But I'm going to be a liaison for this kid because they feel comfortable talking. Like, so what kind of man do you have to be to create that space? Mm. And the problem is, is people aren't going to like you for it. Right. Because you're not one of them. You know, when dudes are texting you to come over and bring a six pack of beer and play video games, I'm like, video games? <laughs> man, come on. I'm not that guy. Yeah. Don't be that guy. Right. You know? So two questions. These totally just two different questions that came up. The first question I had is, how do you, if you're living this different lifestyle from everybody else, how do you f manage that? Like, you know, if, for example, if your kids are growing up vastly different than all the other kids because of how different you're parenting them compared to whether it's the norm or just most people in your neighborhood or whatever, how do you, what, how do you manage that? Because they're on one side, it's like, okay, well, you're providing them with a lifestyle and a, and a certain quality of life that most people are never going to experience. But how do you facilitate hunger and drive and, and, a, and a willingness underneath them to get them to want to go after the things that they want to go after? Because when you look at the stats, especially, especially psychologically, you know, the highest suicide rates are from children that are, you know, of the wealthiest families. Well, I'm going to share something with you. This, this really... Uh this was awesome this morning. Uh, let me find it. My 11-year-old. So I sent, I sent my, f we have a family text. Yeah. And there's a really cool TikTok with mm -hmm. Dana White. Yeah. Talking about kids today growing up. I've seen it. Yeah. And how we've pussified these kids. Yeah. We've created a culture of softness and weakness, right? And parents are at fault for this because parents are living in fear. You know, parents are living above their means and they have to grind it all the time and they, they're not free to just spend time with their kids because they're living above their means, you know, with all these cell phones and multiple cars and, you know, uh, 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 maybe a vacations and vacation homes they can't afford. They're living a lie, constantly shopping, spending money to live above their means to look like something they're not instead of just being who they are. Mm -hmm. And the kids get lost in the shuffle and now you've got society creating this. So I sent this to my family chat and my 11-year-old text back i was born savage <laughs> bro holy shit how does an 11 year old even use those words <laughs> i was born savage you know so it's it's your i always said my house is like a boot camp yeah i remember once we're staying at a house we had people over you know people hanging out drinking wine i was talking to a dude mm -hmm. and one of my kids walked up to me and said hey dad we're going to get ice cream can i have 10 bucks i said absolutely do 20 push-ups Mm. She dropped down, did 20 push-ups. I reached in my pocket, gave her 10 bucks. She walked out the front door with some friends. And the guy's looking at me like, what just happened? I said, what do you mean? He said, <laughs> your kid wanted, I said, yeah, it's my money. It's not theirs. They got to earn it. Shit doesn't grow on trees. Right. Right? I had, uh. My kids never needed or wanted for anything. But I let them create and build right. and earn. <sighs> earn it. Yeah. Right. And if they're athletic, how great do you want to be? Or do you just want to be good? Mm. If you want to be just good, I'll support that. I'll have talks with you to try to pull it out of you. But if you're not there and you're not going to put in the extra effort, then you better be okay with that. Just know you'll wake up someday and say, man, imagine if. <sighs> right. And then there's the kids that are just, they're, they're grinders and they like, I want, and they got vision and they're writing the goals and they're putting it on their wall and they're just, you know, so you just give your kids as much as you want, but you can't force them. You got to let them be ultimately who they're going to be, and they're still going to be a lot better than they would have been if you didn't put the energy into them. Mm. 
you know, so it's, it's the kids these days have so much access to stuff. I think TikTok and all that's great, but it could be horrible. So the other question, the second question was, because you were talking about that guy that had asked you to come with a six pack of beer and come play video games. And, you know, to me, I'm in a spot where I'm 22, you know, at, to some, at some level, it's still acceptable for me to be doing that kind of thing, depending on what my goals are, whatever. Where, I guess this is kind of a two-parter, when do you know when it's time to be like, fuck that, man, I don't want to do it. Like, I, I can't hang around you anymore. Like, when do you know when it's time to, to move on past certain people? And for you personally, when did you, when did you notice that your circle started to, to really shift, if it did? So you'll know when you pull away from a situation and you're like, that was a complete waste of time. Mm. Or you just don't feel right. You're like, man, I could have been doing five other things. And you don't have to tell the people. You just get busy. You know, I had conference calls. I had things to do. I was in the middle of something. You know, they couldn't handle the truth. I wasn't going to judge them. I just knew in order for me to get to where I wanted to go, I couldn't be there. Just couldn't be. You know, I had work to do. And how much time do I have done to get that work done? Because you never know when your time's up. So I got to get as much shit done as I can before my time is up. A lot of work to do. Mm. And, um, you know, when did that start? Man, I go back to college. I had an awesome crew. You know, I was, you know, my, my college friends will laugh because I had all my goals written out back then. And I wanted five kids. And I wanted one of them was going to be named Hurricane, my first son, H U R K A N E, and I've got Kane. My wife said, "Well, let's just name him Kane," and I got five kids. You know, so I had everything written out on a yellow legal pad. So back then, and uh, you know, my my closest buds back then, my best man at my wedding, we were goofballs. You know, we 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 partied hard and played hard, and but we all worked. We all had jobs all through college. We all paid our way. Um, but we, we had conversations and vision. And then when I went off to chiropractic school, it got even deeper, you know, it got deeper because now I'm around people talking more philosophy of life. And, and there was people in there that just weren't, and they were just off partying and doing stuff. And I, to me, it was work. You know, I had to work hard to get through chiropractic school and, you know, I was working three jobs and I maybe averaged three to four hours of sleep at night. And when I wasn't at work or whatever, I was reading, writing, listening to cassettes back then we had. Spent thousands of dollars on cassettes to learn um, and just rifle through stuff. So it's been a long, you know, I could go back to when I was, I think, 11, 12 years old and I read the book Think and Grow Rich and Greatest Salesman in the World, you know, because I was going through a tough time at home. For some reason, I found that book, Think and Grow Rich. I don't know how I got it. And I read it. And it just changed my, my life. And then Tony Robbins, um, what was his big first book? Uh, Awaken the Giant Within. Awaken the Giant Within. It's a good book. Whew, dude, I read that thing. You know, I was, I was up late at night in my parents' basement. You know, my parents ended up divorced, and I was just down there reading, reading. We, we didn't have YouTube or nothing, so you had to sit there and read. And I still have that book, and I got notes in the margins, and... Um, and I just got lost in it. And I was different. I was different. But, you know, the goal, some of the goals I had to be a professional baseball player got wiped away when I got injured. I knew nothing about chiropractic. And then I woke up one day and it's like I'm going to chiropractic school. Like I had no idea. So like what you think your path is right now could change in one conversation, one incident. So you can't dwell on it. You just got to get up every day and make a decision. How am I going to handle this day? What am I going to do to be better? What am I going to do to grow? And you don't know who you're going to come across, you know. There's no interaction like us going out to that diner. It's just a catalyst for you to send you in a direction. Right. Right? And you don't know what another conversation is going to do in another conversation. And you'll wake up and be 50 years old and go, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And it's success leaves clues. Yeah. You keep doing what you're doing, you're going to be successful. <sighs> you're going to be a millionaire. Yeah. You're going to be a multimillionaire. Yeah. You're going to attract a lot of money. You know, it's just going to have, it's natural. It's yeah. a natural law. Right. My friends are all multimillionaires. Right. That could sit them in this room right now. You, you really wouldn't know it. Mm. They're not flaunting it. Right. But they're, they're, they work, you know, they work. And that's one of these kids have to realize, you know, there's, you know, I'm, I'm reading this book right now, the four hour work week. 
and I'm not reading it because I only want to work four hours. It's just how can I do systems smarter? Right. Because I don't care what anyone says, especially if you're starting out, you're going to be working 80 to 100 hours a week because right. your brain never shuts down. Yeah. It's not like you show up to an office. I mean, I've done, so, I've spent many, many nights walking through the neighborhood at three in the morning, thinking, writing, uh, just exploring. Mm. So it's the life of an entrepreneur. The life of a successful person is freaking work. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the thing that I immediately thought of, and I'm not even really sure why I thought of it, but when you were talking about, you know, how it's just, Basically, it's just different. Like you, you, you know, the way you think, the way you act, the way things are, especially when you start separating yourself from the people you used to hang around. Things just become different. And I remember the time I was at your beach house, and we we were talking about David Goggins, and everyone's sitting there, and you were real quiet, but I was sitting there, and you know, my ego was way bigger at the time, so I was getting fucking pissed because everyone's like, "He's a fucking idiot. He's running on broken feet. What a fucking moron!" And I'm sitting there, I'm like, "You don't get it. You guys are stupid. Like, you don't understand." And, you know, we went back and forth, back and forth. And then I don't remember what you said, but we were sitting at, we were sitting outside eating and, and I don't know what you said, but in that moment I was like, oh shit. I'm like, he gets it. And then I was like, I don't know. It was like probably like a couple of weeks later where I was reflecting and I was like, okay, why were you and I the only ones at that table that were on the same page? And I was like, because we're the ones that understand what that meant what it what it takes to run on broken feet right it's not the fact that he's running on broken feet and to me that was one of the most pivotal moments for my mindset of like oh like i'm built different and that was the, one of the first times where i actually felt that way where i was like oh i'm gonna attract these things because i don't think the same way as everybody else does i don't act the same way that everybody else acts and the reason why is because i just think differently and getting that affirmation from you when you spoke up in on behalf of David Goggins, you know, and at the time he wasn't nearly as big as he is now, you know, that was a huge pivotal moment for me. But again, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, why do you think that way? And that it, to me, it's a perfect example of you surround yourself with certain people. And if you surround yourself with certain dudes that despise David Goggins and thinks he think he's a moron, it's probably a good signpost that those are, those are not the people you should be hanging around. And it's in in the knee jerk reaction is to knock someone down and make fun of them mm -hmm. or talk shit behind their back. Mm -hmm. I know a ton of people do it to me. Ask me if I care. <sighs> I do. I care a little bit, mm. but I don't care that much. Like it'll bother me, you know. It'll be like, mm, all right, but I I know I got to keep moving forward. Right. And I'm not. You can't argue with stupid. You can't argue with anger. You can't argue with jealousy, mm -hmm. and that's the place it's coming from. Yeah. It's jealousy. Instead of, I'd rather sit with them and say, you could do it too. You know, if you really had to, you could run on a broken foot. You could keep running until you shit yourself and keep going. But what it, what is it that is in Coggin's soul? It's not in his brain. It's something that awoke in his soul. And this is what Wake Up Humans is all about. It woke him up one day to wake up where he was 300 pounds. He was an exterminator hating life, making no money, to look in the mirror and say, I'm done. And then walk into a Navy SEAL recruiting center and say, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And they basically laughed at him and said, bro, you can't run a mile. And then he started training and he lost like 180 pounds or something in three months because he just, he just said, okay, I just need to move my body as much as I can to burn this shit off. And he was just, and when you study him deeper, you see the pain he had in his life with his father and his mother and how he was brought up and he was beaten and the emotional stuff he went to. At some point, you're running away from all that, right? You're trying to create a different kind of pain to heal, but then you got to meet it face on. Mm -hmm. And I truly feel with where he's at in life now, with all the conversations he's had, he's grown into having to face what happened to him with his father and his upbringing and everything to heal from it right which is why he's who he is you know and it's why he's created what he has is because it he had to do it to save his own life and he had been through so much emotional misery that he got lost in the run the workout the grind because it helped him heal mm. everybody's got that everybody's got it on some level everyone that i consult and talk to it's like let me find that suck let me find that pain let me find that thing now let's heal from it. And that's what the backpack's all about. It's, you know, I was raised to just get over it, move on. You never get over it. It never goes away. It's there the rest of your life. You just have to own it. 
and realize it was my fault or it wasn't my fault. I forgive all parties involved, but now what can I learn from it? So when that shit pops up, when it triggers in my life, I have it off on a shelf over here and I can look at it and say, I own you. Mm. You're my bitch. Because it never goes away. And it could be as simple as you smell something, you hear a song, and it brings you back 15 years and makes you sad. And you got to be able to pull yourself out of it and say, uh-uh, I know you, I know you, conscious mind, you want to you wanna react this way. But my subconscious mind knows that's not who I am. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull myself out of this. And that's where you change your state of mind and you just own it. And every time you do that, it becomes easier. The, the more you walk away from people that aren't adding value to your life, the less you attract people that aren't adding value to your life. So you don't have to do it as much. You'll recognize it. In the past, I'd have conversations with people and I'd be like, can you hold on a minute? I got to go do something. And I don't go back. And I don't have to explain it to them. I don't have to try to fix them. I don't have to judge them because you don't want to judge people. That's, that's obnoxious. But I don't have to be around them. I'm not putting myself in the situation. Now, how do you walk away? Because, like, you know, I look at I look at a figure like you, and I, th- I feel like, you know, for somebody like you, it, it, at least from my perspective, it seems like it's easier for you than it is for somebody like my friend Cal, my partner Cal. He is just the most empathetic, kind dude in the fucking world. Like, he will make you believe that you and him are exactly the same just so that you don't feel like excluded just so that you feel loved just so that you feel good and like that's his superpower you know people everybody loves cal yeah but oftentimes that's at the expense of his own beliefs that's at the expense of his own view of himself that's at the expense of his identity and so to me i look at someone like you and i look at someone like cal it's like okay it's at least in hindsight it looks like it's easier for someone like you to walk away because of your personality very hard but what's your advice to somebody like cal or somebody who finds it a lot harder to be like Nah, man, I won't play video games with you anymore. Nah, man, I'm not going to sit back and drink with you anymore. Like, what do you tell somebody? Like, they know they need to walk away, but they just don't know how. You ever watch UFC? Yeah. Would you get in the ring with any of those guys? (laughs) Fuck no. Did they start out that way? No. No. So they started, their first step was to walk into the gym. And then they probably said, okay, start hitting the heavy bag. Like, let's just start getting some motor skills. And eventually you're going to end up in the ring and some dude's going to knock you out. At some point, you're going to get hurt and you got to make a choice. I'm going to keep getting hurt or I'm going to build myself so I'm not getting hurt as much. So when you say I could look at someone like you, I've been doing this a long time. You know, I've been doing it shit. I could go back to when I was 12 years old and explain situations and things that happened that I could go, wow, that was pivotal. So we're talking over 40 years of being in the ring of life and having to make a choice and realizing if I don't make that choice, that's not going to fuel my my life in the direction I want to. But the more you do it, the easier it becomes. You know, it's, I'm a big lover. I'll do anything for anybody. I've done a lot for people and then got screwed. So I came up with a saying for myself is I'll bend over backwards, but I won't bend over. Mm. And that's a big one. There comes a point where I realize, all right, I'm a giver, but I'm not a sap. Like I'm not going to sacrifice my principles, my integrity, or my respect. You start affecting those three things, out, done. This relationship's a one-way street, and uh, my spirit doesn't deserve that. You know, I hung out with a Navy SEAL one night. I was speaking at a conference, and I was exhausted. I was going to speak and fly out, and then I realized they had this Navy SEAL speaking. and They had a picture of him, but it turned out he was a lot younger. So I'm hanging out at night, and we're at the hotel bar, and I look over at the, the bar, and I see this older guy around the same age as me. I'm like, I see him, and I'm like, he looks different. So I walked over and stood by him to order a drink, and I looked at him, and I said, are you the seal? And he looked at me and said, how do you know? I said, you're different. We hung out that entire weekend. So we got to talking, and I said, what is it like to be you? Like, they've invested like a couple million in you. You're a badass. You could take out whoever you want. You've been dropped behind lines. You've swum in the oceans in the middle. No fear. And he goes, no, there's always fear. But he said, you know, I'm a protector. I'm a protector of your freedom and everyone in this room's freedom. I don't want to hurt anybody. But if they're going to try to hurt you and you can't protect yourself, I'm going to step in. I was like, wow, just the way he said it. Like he's trained at a level to protect all of us because we can't. 
right? And the things they're doing that we don't even know about. He was telling me stories how they're dropping them in places and detonating things and shutting down communications and no one sees them. I'll never do that. But he's done it. And he's he's there because he's there to protect us. So we got to take that same philosophy and principle of life on how do I build myself up so I could protect other people that can't. I could serve others to help make their life better on a bigger level. Because I feel like that's why God put me on this planet. It's not just to exist, right? But to help other people exist and grow and thrive. Not just survive in life, but how can we help each other thrive in life? And you start giving, loving, serving out of your own abundance because you've created it in your life and you could see the hurt in someone else's life and now help them. And when you lose yourself in service like that, man, life is just a, takes on a much bigger purpose. Is that what fuels you? Yeah, definitely. Because it seems like, you know, I, I look at someone like you, like just a simple fact alone, like just, you know, as a surface level tip of the iceberg, you're flying to and from Florida like every week. Yep. <laughs> like you're doing a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. Like you're busy. You're very busy. Like what, what keeps you going? So you got to realize you're going to make a sacrifice, you know, especially as a man. You're going to have to make an ultimate sacrifice. It's like those Navy SEALs, you know, the 10% of them make it through boot camp, which is great, and everyone goes and they get their pin, and it's awesome. But I'm like, man, but now he's getting dropped off in another country on the top of a mountain, and he's hoping he gets out. You know, so when you make a decision like I did to, to pick up my family and move them for our personal reasons and reasons of freedom and, and raising my kids – comes with a sacrifice, right? So, you know, my businesses are up here. I can't ignore them. So I'm learning how to do that better. And for me to jump on a plane, I'm like, I'm sitting in a chair watching a movie. I never watch TV, really. I watch Netflix every week now because I'm on this plane, usually with no Wi-Fi, and I'm trying to watch things that kind of fuel me, right? It's a constant search of just watching things to fuel me. Um because I have a hard time reading a book on a plane, or I'll do Audible. But I do it for the kids, because I know it's fueling the fire for my kids' life and their education and their progression and where they're going. I didn't want them around them. There's an energy that they were around. I didn't want them around the environment. And it's been the greatest thing we ever did. Mm. So when people say, how do you do it? I just don't think. I don't overthink it. It just is what we made a decision, and now I just go on a plane. And I feel blessed that I could do it. That I'm in a place to do it. Now, will I do it all the time? No, I'm going to create a system where I don't have to do it every week. I can maybe go every other week or every third week. You know, it's just now I never thought I'd be in this position. Well, now I'm learning, right? I'm putting it out there to attract myself a mentor who's around 65 years old, who's ahead of me in the game that could sit down and take an x-ray in my life and say, hey, have you thought about this? What about doing this? And I know that's going to happen. And then it's going to make some decisions easier, mm -hmm. right? But we're just not there yet. You know, we've got all these businesses that are building and developing that are just not there yet. But right. when they're there, there's going to be a lot more freedom. I was, I was stuck in an airport with my son. He's on a national baseball team, and we've been flying all over the country every week. And two weeks in a row, we just, well, three, four weeks in a row, we just had a shit show. And we're laid over and just flights delayed and tornadoes. And, and I don't get emotional about it. I'm like, it is what it is. So the last time we're laid, we, we got stuck in Atlanta and... <laughs> He's chilling out. And he goes, hey, Dad, we just need to get our own jet. I said, you're right. We do. Three days later, a friend of mine sends me a text on how to have your own jet and how to, you know, be part of a part owner of a jet that I there's an app that I could book it. And I just have to walk on the runway, get on it, fly me to where I need to go, fly back. And I didn't say to him, oh, bro, that's stupid. No, you can't. People are doing it. So who do I have to be to get to that level to do it? Mm. So that's a goal. I'm going to type in the app, walk out on the tarmac, jump on our plane, let's go. And now we could fly out at night and be back wherever we need to be. Mm. And it's money is not an issue. So what do I got to do to create that flow to make that happen? Because people are doing it. So instead of him shutting him down and saying, no, 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 bro, you're right. Let's do it. You know, and then I say, well, Kane, what does that look like? Like, what do we have to be creating? Because I want him thinking, too. Mm -hmm. It's like you got to have, you know, the businesses producing and you got to have, yeah, okay. 
So he knows it's not free. It's work. Right. You know, you plug in that mentality. It's always a lesson with the kids. Right. It's not just a common conversation. Right. Now, when did you get to the point where you, like, was there a point when you were sitting there and you were like, I feel like I'd never have to work again? Like, was there ever a point where you were like, oh, fuck, like, I'm at a certain level of achievement, whether it's money or whatever, where you're like, oh, I'm good and my kids are good. Like, what was there a point like that? Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of there now. Mm. You know, it's just the hard part is you you, you you always want more experiences in doing things. Um, but I don't want to lose the experience of creating and the and the drive. You know, I, I had knee surgery maybe a little less than two years ago. Mm-hmm. So um, I just stayed down in Florida for a couple of weeks. It was during the holidays, so the offices chill out. So I took like two weeks off. And I'm like, this is retirement. This is boring. Like, I, I will never retire, but I don't have to work. There's a difference. Mm. You know, and I've got real estate and stuff that I could sell. It'd be fine. But why? I'm working more now than I ever have. You know, I was up early this morning, trained, conference calls, meetings, employee, things we had to do. And it's challenged me to grow because I've had to learn a lot more. Right. I've had to, you know, there's things I've had to create that right. I, never th- I never thought about. And um, that's the beauty of life. And it's just, why stop? You know, and, you know, people, how much money do you need? If you don't spend a lot, you don't need much. I got five kids, right? Kids aren't cheap. <laughs> my, kids, my kids are busy, sports, whatever. And all my kids work. You know, so they pay their way and do stuff, but it's, you know, you gotta, you gotta, if you're gonna live by a high standard, you're gonna have to create and produce and it never ends. Why do you think so many people look forward to that, to that, that idea of where you can just kick back and never work again? (laughs) I think it's just been implanted in society. You know, people want the job with the state or a company that provides a 401k that is going to set them up for later. Mm-hmm. And now they're telling them when to show up to work, when they can leave, when they can have vacation, uh, how much they're making. They're going to cap them out. Unless you're going to go on and become a big executive or something, you're going to cap out at a number that's going to keep you in a certain box in life. If you're okay with that, if you need that comfort and you need that security, and that's good for you. And then you can retire usually around 65 and you have money in the bank in the 401k and you can live off of that. And you can, you know, they, they create these buffets in these senior days where it's discounted so you can manage your money better. Yeah. So you could, you're, you're in this corral now of life. You can live in that and be okay. That skews me out. And then there's people that that skews them out and they say, well, I'd rather own the buffets and the other buffets and I'd rather be able to go to Europe for three and a half weeks and just chill and drink wine and go look at art and because I can, right? Or I can go on the app and say, hey, let's go to Bermuda for a couple of days and let's, let's take this jet and you could just book it on the app and you go spend a couple of days and then fly back and people are like, hey, what'd you do this weekend? Eh, nothing, just hung out with friends because they just don't need to know. And that's... That's a whole different animal. And right. not everybody's cut from that cloth. Right. You know, there's right. there's a lot of risk. Definitely. But it's commitment and uh, persistence. Mm. I, I'm, I'm curious to get your two cents because this has been, uh, I'm going to give you the breakdown of what, what's like kind of hot in my life right now. Um, so I graduated, I walked, and then afterwards I had for the past like couple months I've been in a big argument with my mom about getting my diploma because I walked and then I they wouldn't send me my diploma in the mail because I owed a de- like literally one dollar I have a, a balance of one dollar maybe a late fee for a book or something like that whatever and so they won't send you anything because you owe some money <clears throat> and to me I took that as a sign and I was like I don't I don't fucking want the diploma. Like, I want to make sure that piece of paper just collects dust here. I don't ever want that piece of paper because I'm not using it. Like, if I'm going to go pursue therapy or clinical or whatever, like, fine. I'll go get it because I need that to progress. Sure. 
but my perspective was is I don't want to get the piece of paper because I want to become successful and then tell young kids, especially young men in high school and in college, don't go to college if you're an entrepreneur that knows you don't need that. Did you pay for college or your mother did? My mom did. Your mom wants the paper. I know. So send them a dollar fifty so they owe you fifty cents. <laughs> that's what I would do. Well, okay, so so but here's here's the thing is is that's the conversation I have with my mom. But then my perspective on it was, okay, why does she want the piece of paper? Because I'm explaining to her, I'm like, mom, this story that I'm going to be able to tell kids is, in my opinion, more powerful than you being able to show your friends or whoever you want to show that you got the piece of paper. Like, I'm, it, it's, like because what, I, what I'm trying to explain to my mom is like, she paid for my, for my college and it was an investment. I met Cal. I had this podcast room. I learned immense amounts of things. I probably wouldn't have had that meeting with you at the diner. I, there's a million things that wouldn't have happened to fall in place perfectly for me to be successful if I didn't go to college, but it wasn't about the classes. And that's why I don't want the piece of paper. And I want to be able to tell that story because I think it's powerful. And so we went back and forth, whatever. And, you know, she just didn't agree. And we just kept going, kept going. A couple days, what is it probably like? It was probably like a week ago. I get a text from Dr. Falahi. She's the head of psychology at, at Central. And she said, hey, Jason, I noticed you still need one more credit to graduate. Uh, let me know if you want help setting, setting this up. And I was like, hi, I already walked. Like, I don't, I don't really know what you mean. She's like, no, I looked at your degree evaluation. You didn't graduate. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, you still need a credit. Sure enough, we look at all the information I technically didn't graduate. I have one credit left. I have everything for psych. I have everything else. I could literally go take a shitty gym class and graduate. And to me, it's just like, that's like, for me, that's the sign of like, I'm going to leave it at that. Because if, again, if I want to go back and pursue clinical therapy or do something where I need the degree, I'm going to do it. But right now I'm like, I'm fucking killing it. Like seriously, not to blow smoke up my own ass, but like Cal and I are getting after it. And over the past six months, we've, we've grown tremendously. And it's going to keep going forward like that. And I know it's going to get exponentially better and better and better. Not just money, but life, success, happiness, fulfillment, peace. And to me, I think that's a testament to, I did the four years. I did the stuff that everyone's saying you need to do. I could get the 401k, but I'm one degree, I'm one credit off. And I'm not going to fucking take it because I want to be able to tell the story to kids of, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to get after it and you want to build a business and you want to live this kind of lifestyle, I'm proof that I did that. I experienced it. I did the things that you think you need to do, took the classes and I'm not using it. And I, and I left that credit on the table because fuck that. Like I didn't need it Yeah. to me. If I could go back again, hindsight is a bitch. It's not actually real. But if I can go back and tell somebody that's in high school, I'd be like, dude, get, get an FHA loan, buy a fourplex, live with three of your buddies, learn how to do real estate and then build a business on the side and hustle. Like you can get all those experiences doing that while making money and starting a business at the age of 18 rather than 22. Right. To me, that's the entrepreneur spirit. Yeah. And again, it's not for everybody. Most people want the 401k and that's great. And you should go to college. But to me, it's a powerful story to the people that listen to my stuff, that listen to your stuff, because I think it's a testament to you don't need it. So what you got to ask yourself is your decision, are you making your decision based off so you have a story that you want to be able to tell? And now if you go back and take that credit, well, now I'm selling out to the system. Because when you said I finished, well, you didn't finish. Mm. You did 3.9 years. Right. So you didn't finish. You didn't finish the task you set out to do. Mommy paid. Mm -hmm. Mommy's like, dude, I put money aside since the time you were a baby yeah. to be able to give this to you. Right. And if you look at coming out of high school, you probably didn't have facial hair. Definitely not. You thought totally different. Definitely. Your walk in life was totally different. Yeah. You think you could have bought a, do a fourplex and lived in it and sustained life. Maybe not. Maybe. Mm. Maybe some can. But did college give you that, that time to kind of discover yourself, have conversations, hear teacher regurgitate information, give you ideas, especially on what you don't want to do and what you don't want to be. Mm -hmm. So college was good for you. 100%. And I'm with you 100%. It's like college is not there for everybody. If you want to be a dentist, doctor, accountant, you have to. Right. And then you say, well, a couple of years later, if I want to do something, I'll go back and take it. Mm -hmm. Well, what if, like, they won't accept the credits now? What if they won't? They're going to say you need more. What if they, who knows what the mm -hmm. world's going to look like then? Where now it's, right. it, it's at first it was a dollar for a book. Right. Now it's a credit. Right. What's next? And so 
you, you really got to look at that situation and say, how hard is it to take a credit? Maybe they could use this as a communications thing you're doing. And hey, I'm doing all this podcast and communication stuff. I've built a business. Can we use that as an entrepreneurial credit? Because mm -hmm. the system sucks. So none of us want to be yeah. none of us want to be part of the system. But sometimes you got to jump through hoops. I mean, I, I dude, I was horrible in science. You know, I yeah, I heard your story. You know, I failed boards a couple times. I had a, I had a, I had a. Right. Instead of getting mad at the system, I had to work within the system in order to get to where I wanted right. to go. Well, I'm not even against the system. I'm against society's pressure to push kids through things that they don't fucking want. Like, you know, the prime example is Alex. Like, that kid should have started a business two years ago. He knew he wanted to start a business. He knows he doesn't want to go into physical therapy. Yeah, but dude, Alex was, he didn't have pubic hair a couple of years ago. <laughs> I, you know, he's a sweetheart. No, he I know. You know, so you got to buy time. I, I think college for some kids buys time. Right. It, it buys time to say, okay, I'm going to learn how to shave. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn how to walk into a room with people I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now I'm around kids that are four years older than me that have beards. I'm around beautiful girls and I'm, you know, handling these of emotions course. and stuff that you have no clue about. I'm showing up to a keg party and I've got to, am I going to be the one getting shit faced on the floor? Am I going to be the one doing, you know, handling myself? Now there's a fight breaks out. Am I the one that's breaking it up? Am I right. the one? There's so many different things Completely that, agree. that will show up that when you're now 35, 40 years old, walking into a conversation, you've created husks, you've created scars, you've created experiences that help you handle that moment. hundred percent. But it's, the pricing and what they're charging kids for school right. is absolutely insane. Of it's course. become a huge business. Yeah. And I get all that, but you know, you dove into the system and you know, listen, you went to central, which is not expensive. No, especially as a local kid. Definitely not. So you use them, right? You use them to be able to build up to where you're going and mm -hmm. have experiences that just, I think you get more in a state of gratitude. Yeah. It's all right. Central. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Now, you know what? Uh, yes, doc. Thank you. This doctor reaching out to you mm -hmm. is looking out for you. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. She didn't have to do that. She could be like, ah, that kid's an idiot. Oh, yeah. I was, you know, and, and, and you know, the, I think the resentment comes from the, the, the feelings I get of reliving the arguments I keep having with my mom because most of it is gratitude. Because well, that's what you got to ask yourself. Are you doing it more to spite your mom? No. Like ge genuine answer from the bottom of my heart now. Okay. Because, I, again, I think... Whatever you got to do to have that experience, I think you should do it. And again, and I and I would actually tell somebody if they had my specific situation of mom's going to pay for college, go to college, mm -hmm. do the classes, do kind of your bare minimum, start the business if you can, but have those experiences because ninety percent of college is not from classes. But that's that's the whole. I don't want the piece of paper. That's that's what it is to me. Is like the education wasn't the education. The education was going to a party, learning how to handle it when people are in a fight, learning how to live with somebody else, learning how to shave, like, like yeah. all these things about life. Like you learn about life. You don't, it's not the history and systems of psychology that helped me. It's the, I went there and I had a whole bunch of experiences and I learned a whole lot about life. I learned about what it's like to not wake up and just throw my clothes in the laundry basket and then they come magically... It, perfectly folded out of my bed like I, you get that like I, I'm so with it I think it's the fact that I think I know it's the fact that I'm not getting that piece of paper because it, it, you know what people keep asking me is they're like you have nothing to show for it I'm like what do you mean I have nothing to show for it I'm like look what I'm doing with everything I have everything to show for it right college was the best thing that ever happened to me right but the piece of paper is what I think people need to drop. Because if you're an entrepreneur and you're getting a 401k, you're putting yourself in a cage. And that's what I want people to, to go against. Right. And just know that the majority don't go against. Right. So you're preaching to a smaller crowd. Definitely. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, so, if, you know, it's, I've had this conversation with a lot of people that just, I can't do that. You know, I, I've, I've been meeting a lot of young doctors who I'm talking to them about opening their own business in their own office. I've been doing it for years. Then you realize they're not made out for that. They're better off being in an office, just taking care of people and, and adjusting them and don't have to make a lot of decisions, mm -hmm. which is why we've created this formula to train them, work with them, intern them, put them in a practice. We do all the back end stuff. They just have to show up and work and they'll make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they're happy. 
right? They're comfortable right. with that. And it was, that's hard sometimes to realize, but you could do more. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's made out to do more. And that's really tough sometimes to look at the real at human potential that um, we, we have no limits. It's only the limits we put on ourselves. Right. And sometimes you just can't break down those limits for everybody. And you just got to let them be happy where they're at. How do you reconcile that? I think that's been my biggest battle. Is like I look at everybody else and I know, I'm like not that I think of them better because I genuinely don't. I believe God created everybody the same because we're all human beings. But to me, it's like I look at somebody where I'm like, if you just did this and woke up earlier and hit the gym and did this, like, but you don't you don't reconcile it and you just stop looking at other people. And God didn't create us all the same. People use that state. Think about that statement. God created us all equal, all the same. No, He did not. There's no way. You know, look at me. I want to go be a sprinter. I want to go train for the Olympics to be a sprinter. I could say I could do whatever I set my mind to. I will never be a sprinter. I will never play in the NBA. I'm just not made up for it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't created like the guy that had those genes to do it. Right. So when we realize we're not all created equal. And if you're going to choose a path, you know, people say you just got to have a lot of passion. You can do whatever you want. Not true. You got to find out what you love to do. And what you could be good at, you may not be great at it yet, but if I if I mm. work, now I've got, this is what my makeup is driving me to do, and now I pour passion into that and persistence, now you're going to kill it. Instead of just, you can do whatever you set your mind to. God created us all equal. No, he did not. Right. And that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Right. And, and it's when you find, what am I good at? What do I love to do? What do I enjoy? And then you go after that, and that's what you pour your soul into and your passion into. That's the definition of success. So what do you tell somebody that's teetering on the edge? Like, let's say, for example, somebody that I have no idea who they are. Let's say they're in college pursuing an exercise science degree, but they know they could absolutely kill it if they started their car detailing business, but they're afraid to jump over that edge and, and go for it, even though they know that they're an A player, they know that that's what they want to do. It's a simple conversation. It's like... What are you afraid of? They're afraid of failure. Usually those are the people that have a very secure environment. And they're afraid to get hurt. Because when you, when you pull away, and you, you're going to get hurt. You're going to stick your neck out there. You know, there's a, a Maya Angelou, our deepest fear, is, is standing out in the crowd, stepping out, taking chances. You're going to get hurt. But it's, what kind of hurt is it? Right? And that's what life hopefully gives you experiences you know, if I'm not going to get stabbed in the heart, I've been punched in the head a number of times, it's not going to hurt. Right. It's just two days later, it's going to be a story. Right. You know, so they're afraid of failure, or can they do it? Or what yeah. if they fail? And What are you going to think of them? Mm. What are their parents going to think of them? So they stay comfortable. But you can't stay comfortable forever. Right. You know, and the worst part is, and I've seen this happen hundreds of times, people take that comfortable road and they're killing it and they're successful and they're 54 and the company lets them go. Whoo! Now they're saying I should have, and that's one thing is you don't want to should have all over yourself. <laughs> like you want to, you want to. If you're feeling it, man, especially you're young in your twenties. God, fail, man, fail a lot. Well, what, no one's getting hurt. Well, what's your advice, like in that moment? So, like this, this person who's had a fucking easy ass life. You care about this person more than you probably should. Yeah, and that's what it comes down to. You just got to now, because the more you're focusing on them and trying to help them find it, you're losing time that you can be doing working on yourself. So you have the conversation. You can sit with them and say, hey, this is my last conversation. This is what I see in you. And be honest. You've got a cushioned life. You've been pampered. You've had everything done for you. But you have this edge to start this thing that you could kill it. And I, I see it in you. But do you see it in yourself? And if they say no... Not much you could do for them. If they say, well, yeah, well, then what's holding you back? I'm afraid. Can I help you? I'll partner with you for the first five years, then you buy me out. I'll support you. You won't be alone because they're afraid of being alone. And if they say, well, yeah, that that could be good because now you're giving them a cushion because now we both fail or we both succeed. And you say, okay, I don't want to do this forever. I'll do it for five years. We're killing it, then you'll buy me out. And then if they say yes, then let's do it. If they say no, all right, man, you tried. 
and that's it. Then you just, you, you proverbially walk away because you're not going to walk away from the friendship, but you're going to focus on yourself. And then five, 10 years from now, it's going to be, oh shit, I should have. Wow. And listen, if there's that vision of that business and this person can't fulfill it and you see that there's a void and a need in society to do it, find someone else who will do it with you. And you be the motivator and the driver and the implementer behind it, and you build the team that is doing the work and let it start killing it, whatever, and then five, six years, seven years, you turn around, you sell. I'm out. You guys are good. You make six figures or a million bucks or three million bucks from the transaction. It's a great formula. Oh, yeah. And when you help others find their purpose and help them find their drive in life, and a lot of times they're just scared and afraid of being out to pasture by themselves and say, okay, I can be the strength behind you pushing you. I'll help you. It's going to cost you money, but you're going to make money. We good with that? Yeah. Then let's get going, and I'm going to drive you, and we're going to work, and now we're killing it. Hey, company's good. This is what it's valued at. This is what you owe me. We're out. And done. We're going to play that clip back in a couple of years. All right. Of you speaking. We're going to play that shit back because I have a funny feeling that that's going to be exactly what happens. But we'll see. What do you like on time? You got to go? No, I'm good. Okay. Because I actually didn't get to any of the questions that I have. What do you got? Uh, um, they're more so pertaining to me. Um, so this was, this was the big one. Um, progression, ebbs and flows. What do you tell people that are at a low point but are still hungry? Because I feel like, you know, at the point where I'm at right now, you know, if I look back in hindsight, you know, if we look at a graph of my personal development, as corny as that sounds, I was here when I started college, and now I'm here. Obviously, it's not a straight line. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. That's life. What do you tell people when they know that they're still hungry? They know in hindsight, like I, like I know logically, like things are still getting better. I, like I know it, but I just don't feel it. Like I'm at that low point where I'm like, I'm self-sabotaging. I'm doing stupid stuff. I'm making dumb decisions. Not dumb enough to take myself out or take out the business, but stuff that's going to bring me to a spot where it's going to push me back. And then you're at that point where you've pushed yourself back. What do you tell those people? Well, you said it yourself. You're self-sabotaging. Right. So I would say write down what you're doing to self-sabotage and then stop self-sabotaging. <laughs> do the opposite. <laughs> it's, it's really that simple. And you just answered your own question. Yeah. And sometimes you got to sit down and realize, all right, I'm doing this. Yeah. But I started here. Am I willing to go back to there? Mm -hmm. Or I'm now I'm actually grateful to be here. So that new low is not as low as where you started. It's not as high as you're going to go. But even when you go high, there's lows. <sighs> and, I, and that's what I tell guys. I'm like, you, just, you don't want a bad low that's going to hurt you. It's a low like, oh, man. That, that, that sucks, but I'm not hurt. You're not hurt. And so enjoy that. And, I, and the other way to look at it is, you know, you ever surf? I have not. Me neither. I tried it once. Didn't go well. <laughs> but you fly, you, you're swimming out there, just floating, waiting, thinking. And all of a sudden, here comes a wave. And now you got to get the energy and jump on the board and ride that wave. But that wave's going to end. You got to go back out and float and wait and prepare for the next wave. That's life. Those down times is when you're preparing, creating, and you wait for the next wave, which is the next opportunity, and you jump on it. And it just makes life simpler. And when you realize today's stress is just another story next week or two weeks from now, it's not that bad. If it's not going to kill you, it's not that bad. It's just another story. Was there ever anything, especially like if you look back to when you were in your early 20s, where there were certain things that were your, so let's say we could say your vices, your things that brought you down that you knew were a problem, but were in this middle stage where you know eventually you're going to work on it, but you're in this weird spot where you just don't want to change? I mean, my vice was my, my emotional state with my family. And I hated seeing people hurt and, and suffer because of people's stupid decisions. 
And, you know, one of the biggest things was I come from a family of alcoholics. And I'd always say, why couldn't they just stop? Life would be so much better. And through years of study and transformation, you realize it's an illness, it's their weakness, and it just, they just, not only they destroy their life and their expression of life, but a lot of people around them. And I was able to pull out of it and heal and learn, but there's people I know that never rebounded from their actions. And that would piss me off. And then you wake up and you realize that when things got tough and you got down or whatever, I'm going to go have a couple drinks. I'm going to go start being stupid. Then you realize, well, wait a minute. I'm kind of just being like them. That doesn't make sense. So you got to learn to to create the boundaries of, I want to be able to hang out and have a couple drinks, but I don't want to cross the line and be stupid because I saw what that did to people's lives. So I saw that could have been a vice, my emotions Uh, I was quick to attack and want to fix things. And there was a lot of times violence involved, um, which never works. You're not going to, and that was just my own emotions. My biggest vice and to this day will be my emotions and how I handle situations. And, and I've learned to just think before I speak, think before I react, walk away, talk about it tomorrow Don't hit send on that text. Don't hit send on that email because it's coming from that old story. Mm. It's just emotional and it's okay. So just give it some time and then just go, "Ah, all right, I'll handle it this way. And I'm with 54 years old, still go through those conversations, but it's just few and far between because I've been doing it so long. Right. Yep. Immediately when you say that, I merely reflect back. I don't know what video it was, but you were saying you're like, you know, people always come up to you and they say, you've changed. And you say, yeah, yeah, you haven't. And that's, I mean, that is what that is. Yeah. You know, and to me, that's, that's, for me, that's the biggest struggle is to look at people that haven't changed as I've progressed, have watched me progress, and then learning to let those people go. Because, you know, when you look back in hindsight, you look at the people that you let go, you look back and you see that letting them go is what propelled you forward because it was a weight that was dragging you down. But in the moment, it's not, it's fuck, it's the worst thing ever. Yeah. Like, how do you, like, what do you tell yourself after that moment? Like, let's say, hypothetically, you're in a relationship <coughs> with even your a girlfriend at the time and you know letting them go is what's best for you, but you just don't, even after you break up with this person, because this is the thing that I see all the fucking time, all the time, because people always come to me, especially the college kids, because they know I, I do a lot of, sp- of talking on, about relationships. And they always say, they're like, yeah, I let them go, but then they get back together. And then they break up, and then they get back together. And they break up, and it just keeps happening over and over and over again. And to me, it's that that uncomfortable feeling of being alone afterwards that prevents you from moving forward because you feel like your best bet is to mask that feeling of, shitty i need to move on i need to learn how to be alone with you just use a vice and get back into the relationship and it just keeps happening over and over i mean at that age college is just immaturity right i mean it's just the maturity level between college and your 30s and then 40s and 50s it's like the seasons are so different so college can be as simple as they're back together because they just have good sex with each other (laughs) (laughs) that's fair enough (laughs) and then the next one comes along and they Uh, got a girlfriend having great sex that other person has no way back or it's just you don't want to hurt the other person. You feel bad. <laughs> and you really care about them. Right. I mean, it's it, it. you don't have to hate someone to let them go and break up with them. It's just we're not right for each other. Let's just admit it. And it just ch- it changes the language behind it. Or I just, l- I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Mm-hmm. That was later on in my life when I would be with someone and they wanted to marry me. And I'm like, don't s- you're not that ice cream. I don't see myself staying there the rest of my life. I love you. I'll always love you. I really care about you. I want to be happy with you, but I'm not in love with you. Like, we're not going to go deep. And we're just wrong for each other. And that's the soulmate level stuff. College, you just got to do a lot of interviews. You just got to meet people. What am I really looking for? Who fuels me? Who is it? It's like college is the experience. You know, it's the emotion. You know, it's learning. And then all of a sudden, you could be on a trip somewhere, and you've had multiple relationships, and that person comes across you, and you're like, that's different. And it hits you at a whole new level, and that's your soulmate. But you don't know that until you've seen what's not. 
And that's what relationships give you. So a lot of times it's just you tell a young kid, just let it go. And then they're out at a bar and having a couple of drinks and they're back together. Well, no shit. Eventually it's going to crumble. It would have been easier just to let it go. All right. So they're going to go through that experience. They'll be okay. It's so like calming to hear you say that. Because to me, you know, and I know for, uh, this is definitely the case with a lot of the people that I spoke to who are probably even listening to this now, where you hear it and you're like, and you, you think about it and you're in the moment and it's the fucking worst thing ever. And then you're, you're sitting there, you're like, yeah, fuck it. This is what it is. You're going to just have to learn. Eventually it's going to crumble, but you'll, you'll learn. Yeah. It's so fucking freeing. You know, it's funny. I did a seminar. There's, you know, come New Year's, everyone's writing goals, right? Yeah. So I did a webinar this past year because people always talk to me about their goals and how to. Nah, nah, nah. You look at most kids in college, they don't have a vision, let alone goals. Right. The problem with a goal is once you hit the goal, what's next? So it's building a vision. You know, What are your friendships like? What's your faith like? What's your finances like? Um, you know, the, the, I call it the six Fs. Oh, and you got to fill in all these boxes. And when you're able to lay that out for yourself on who you are as a man or a young woman, and then what is that? Where do you project yourself in 10 to 20 years? Right? So my friends and my fun time, I want to have that, especially in college. But someday financially or faith, right, which gives you freedom. There's so much anxiety and depression in these young kids these days because they don't have faith. Right, they, they, they don't, don't. Where do they get their strength from? Or when things get tough, how do they overcome? They're not getting fed that. So if we could feed that to them and help them build a vision for their life and put it in writing. So when things get tough and they could stop and say, "Who am I? What am I grinding towards? And does this feed my experience or not?" It takes the guesswork and the fear out of it, and that puts them on a projectile of. Every decision they're making through college and sitting through class and writing, and if maybe you're not listening to the teacher, you're writing ideas about your own life and what you're working towards, it, it gives you more energy. They walk different. They make different decisions. They attract different people in their life. And now they graduate with a higher purpose instead of just, all right, what's next? Does that resemble kind of what your path was? 100%. Dude, I had, I still have yellow legal. I like using yellow legal binders, the, the legal pads. Mm -hmm. Something about the yellow in your neurology and what it does. And I would write. Some writings were tough, sad, angry, tears on the papers. But I had to release all that. And then it was just my visions. And what do I want? What do I really want? What do I want to be doing? And then the problem was I woke up one day, me and my wife were cleaning out our basement. We found one of them and I had 150 things written and every single one of them we accomplished. <sighs> Crossed off every single thing that I put down on paper. Wow. I hit a point where I was lost, had everything. What do I set a goal for? A boat? I'm not a boat guy. A jet, a Porsche, a great car, a lift in my garage that I have friends that do all this. A sailboat, uh, I didn't, that wasn't me. I didn't want all that. And then it came the idea of opening these offices and helping more docs and consulting people and helping them come through their stuff. That was like, oh, yeah. Now I was up at night. Now I was writing again. Mm. Now it was like my juices were going. And then I was like, here it is. So now I've got these things going on now. It's to jump on a plane is not a big deal because it's fueling the outcome. So it's okay. So these kids could start small and just create. You know, my, my, my daughter Sierra at one point when she was younger wrote on a piece of paper, your eyes are not for just seeing. Something along those lines, I have it hanging in my closet. It's a profound thing that I always resonate with. And it's like when kids can realize there's so much, their life potential is so much bigger than just going through college, get a job, end up married, end up with a small little house, two kids, throw birthday parties. If that's what you want, God bless you. But if you want to go bigger and be more abundant, what does that look like in your life? How do you define that for your life? Because if you don't have it, if your parents aren't feeding it to you and you haven't come across the right teacher or somebody to feed it to you, if you want it, you better find that person now. 
you better have conversations. You better have interaction to open your eyes up and say, and, and, and you won't feel it here in your head. You'll feel it in your soul, your heart. You'll feel it in your sternum like, fuck yeah, that's what I want to do. Mm. And now it's like, whoo, you watch how that circle of friends get tight and talk and converse mm. and, and yeah, let's go start a business. Now let's start another business. Let's start with the detailing business. Now let's do this. Let's kill it. And, and that's where they get that drive. What's Tammy's role in all that? She's, dude, she's, she's, uh, she's my emotional springboard. Like, she's strong. Like, she's got me. She doesn't walk behind me. She walks next to me. She's supportive. She's not yet butting me to death, or we shouldn't. And she's got her own businesses, man. She's her own creator. You know, she owns a couple businesses. Um, she's not a wuss. She'll travel around the world by herself with all five kids without me there because she can, because she's, she's not afraid. She's got faith. She's, she's solid. She's an Im implementer. We have the same philosophy of life. You know, we're not saps. We're going to crush it. We're going to be strong. When things go dark, we know where to go to. We pray. We have faith. Uh, we know where to fall back on. So her role is not just there to support Steve. It's, she's got her own role in what she's doing in life. And I support her. Mm. And I give her freedom to do that. So it's not, you know, people say, you got to have the right wife that's just, you know, no, nah, she's not sitting there making me my eggs in the morning. Right. Here you go, honey, or whatever. But she's got my back. She knows when it's time to say, hey, we need to take a little trip. We need to shut it down for a couple of days. Like, you're, t you're tired. <coughs> she's the one booking all my flights. And when there's cancellations, she jumps on her phone and she enjoys doing it. That would that would get my blood pressure up. It would not be healthy for me. She's she's never complained about that. And we're talking flying every single week, right. changing a flight. Like I was flying back from Alabama the other day, and I had a connection. And the way things have been, it was a forty minute layover. I'm like, no way. It's gonna shit's gonna go wrong, and I don't want to miss the office Monday. So she went on, boom, 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 changed it, Delta flight. You got credits now with Southwest. I, that's not me. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not into that clerical stuff. Right. She just does it because she knows it's fueling our purpose and mission. Mm -hmm. And then I know when she's with my kids and I'm not there, she, we're talking the same language. We have the same philosophy. Um, we're not talking out of both sides of our mouth. Mm -hmm. We have love and respect for each other. If there's an issue, she calls me up. You know, it's just this constant communication, and she's great on holding me accountable on our relationship, you know, um, cause I could get caught up in my work and my stuff and she's good at saying time out. You know, she said from day one, I don't want to wake up and our kids are going off to college and we look at each other and say, who are you? She said that from day one and she's right. That's powerful. Yeah. What was it like when you first met Tammy? Bro, it was immediate, you know? So we, uh, you know, when I, when I first met her, it was like quick. Like I knew I had written down three days before. Cause I'm like, I'm done dating. Right. Like I'm done dating. So I, I sat down with a yellow legal pad on what I want. I wanted a girl that was athletic that could throw a baseball hat on and I could have a catch with a football, go for a run on the beach, um, or put on a dress and walk into a room and people are looking like shit. That's a pretty girl. Um, who had a sense of humor who understood me because I knew I had vision and it was going to be a difficult run. Mm. You know, a couple months before we were getting married, I wrote her a letter giving her an out, letting her know you're going to lose friends. We're going to go through some tough times. People are going to judge us. Like I'm going to be going out there. I'm going to crush it and I'm going to call things out and I'm, I'm on a mission. She's like, I'm with you hundred percent. And I, that, she has that letter. Um, and then I wanted to raise five kick ass kids. And I wanted her to be not the sissy little mom and, you know, well, when are you coming home? I need help. Or, well, you're out of town. Like, I can't handle these kids. Like, she's just like, you know, when I started speaking a lot, there was times where I had to leave her home. And I would travel and I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, we just went out to dinner. She'd throw them all in the Suburban and they're out to dinner and, you know, organized chaos, man. My house was a f organized chaos. It was awesome can't even imagine. It was awesome. But she was all in and yeah. still is, you know. And um, 
I'm blessed, man. Like, and I wrote, I put it in writing. I had that all in writing. And three days later, she walked into where I was and she went to squirt some water from her water bottle and the top flew off and the water went all over me. And the exact words in my head were, that's your wife. No fucking. That was it. I didn't look back. I've been seeing a couple people, whatever. And I just knew it wasn't right. And uh, that was it. Cut all ties. Girls cried. I said, look, I love you, but we're not, it's not, you'll be happy. So then, so, hold on. <clears throat> you actually had that thought. That's crazy. Which thought? That's going to be my wife. 100%. So at the time, I was a massage therapist, and I was running uh, six gyms down in Georgia. I just graduated chiropractic school. I was floundering a little bit because my mom had had a massive stroke. I was taking care of her, so I was kind of locked in. And uh, I met Tammy at the gym, and we kind of became friends. But, you know, I was hanging out with other people, whatever, and then she was pretty persistent, and things. one thing led to another. And then I said, you know, like I'm, uh, I got I to gotta move on with my life. And, like, I, I, I don't want to start succeeding and find somebody and they jump in and just want a big diamond ring and they're a trophy wife. I saw that too many times. I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted someone in the grind with me that was there helping me. That was, and she's fucking that girl, man. And I, when I wrote the goals out and I would love to find that, that yellow legal pad, um, literally three days later, I was sitting at my desk doing notes and I felt someone coming in. I turned to look over my right shoulder she was trying to sneak up on me. I had like a big water bottle with a squirt top and the whole top, and it just soaked me, soaked my papers. I could have got pissed off that she, you know, the paperwork. That's your wife. That was it. Wow. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, it is. Now That's that, fucking awesome. Now that I hear the story again, it's great. That's amazing. What was like, the, what's the, that, like, what's that thing that stands out to you th the most is like, that's my wife. Like that, the, the the thing about her that just makes you tick. It's pure love, man. It's like, you know, the uh, lightning bugs only have one uh, mate, mm. and they find each other through their vibration and the the light frequency, whatever shit they're twinkling attracts each other. And I feel like we have the same thing. You know, there's many different girls we could end up with just because we have a good time we're nice people we have fun but throw us into the grind together are we a solid team mm. you know are we a hall of fame team not just a good team a minor league team are we a hall of fame team like we're going the distance and we're gonna be the best and that's how you got to look at it and it's not an educated thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like you cross off, you have dinner, you have conversations, you have, it's just, you know, our philosophy, there was things that we had to work through, mm -hmm. philosophies and stuff that I had to make sure she resonated with. I mean, she's a pediatric nurse and I didn't want to raise kids on drugs and all the shit they're doing to them. So I had to bring her around people to get edu to, you know, to see how she would handle it. Cause I'm like, if she's not all in, she's out. Right. You know, because I knew I had a whole different outlook on what I was doing with life and my kids, and I wasn't bending. Um, and she, she was the one. It was like God sent her at the right time. It's like the right time, bro. You know, you can't make it up, and there it is. And you just know, you feel it. And what guys have to realize, and girls, is your subconscious mind will talk to you. Everything with college and school and everything in front of us that you see in the world is all educated conscious mind stuff but when you roll deep and get into the subconscious mind which is listening to that voice within and these thoughts you have that you really feel you want to do something and you start listening to that that's where your life changes wow <laughs> see to me that's like wait, how old are you when that happened with tammy yeah so we got married in uh shit 2000 I graduated in 98 it was probably 99 1999 Wait you got to wait so what wait so when did you, you met her in 98 I met her in 1999 Oh shit and you got married a year later 
less than a year. It was probably six or seven months. Wow. Eight months. She could tell you the exact dates and times and yeah. what I was wearing and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm more big picture. No, me too. But it was quick. It was, it was, it was quick. It was like no bullshit. There was, and I had no money. Yeah. I had no money for an engagement ring. My college buddy loaned me money. Wow. And uh, I paid him back. I feel like that's what I want. Like I want, because that that's the big worry for me. Because you know, over the past, I would say, strong year, like at the beginning of the year, I would flaunt i wouldn't even say flaunt but i would tell if you asked me are you going to be a millionaire are you going to be successful i would say yes but there wouldn't be that gut like yes it'd be a verbal spitting throwing up words to you yes now it's a yes like a hundred percent why do you want to be a millionaire i don't care about a millionaire. it's it's a stat i don't give a fuck like i i just want to i want to be able to have freedom that's what i want i want to be able to say what i want so all the it doesn't matter it's all status whatever is not true Mm. You want freedom. Right. So being a millionaire, you could fuck it up. But the way you're thinking, how does becoming a millionaire give you freedom? Freedom from what? I would say the system, really. Like that's my, my gut answer is the system. Uh, because when I look at, you know, uh, to leave my family out of this, but when I look at friends or cousins or, or friends families like or just people that i know well and i see the cap that's put on their life because they don't have true freedom they can't say whatever they want because they can get fired and then their kids aren't eating and they can't pick their shit up and leave if america goes to shit and they can't you, you, do you does that make sense yeah so the and, and I'm, I'm trying to pull this out of you for your listeners too because there's a lot of kids your age that by definition when people see, a, I want to be a millionaire, it's because they see millionaires and they see them living this lifestyle that the majority around them are not living. Mm. And they, they're they raised to think, well, money's not the answer. Well, if you can't make your mortgage payment and you can't feed your kids, money is the answer. Mm. So we have to stop lying to ourselves and our kids with these cliches. It's what people see a millionaire could afford you to do, and usually they're entrepreneurs or work for a big company or involved in real estate, and the freedom to travel, to feed your kids without thinking about it, create experiences for your kids without thinking about it. Mm. You have more freedom to create. And you also have more freedom to help others. And when we look at it that way, you don't bastardize making money. Because you could help other people who aren't as fortunate. 100%. And that's the ultimate blessing. When you turn around and can take 10, 20% and tithe it towards helping others, that's the greatest feeling in the world. You know, when you see a mom whose husband dies and, or their house burns down and they got nothing and you can write a check without thinking, or you got a friend who's, whose wife is dying of cancer and the system can't help her and you pull five friends together and, and pull $80,000 together. To, to send them to some place to save their life without thinking about it. That's freedom. And that's where people need to realize there's nothing wrong with making money. And if you define it as a millionaire, you're a millionaire because the next level's a multimillionaire. Mm. The next level's billionaire. It never stops. When you get there, it's like the next level, the next level. But it's what, how you handle it when you're at that level. But if you're the person that just wants to chill, make 65, 75 grand a year, that's fine too. Mm-hmm. Right, because it all matters is how much you're spending. Right, right. So that's the ultimate answer. Right. But when people say, "I want to be a millionaire," why? Why? Freedom. What's freedom to you? Mm. What is that? What's the vision? Mm -hmm. What are the goals? What's the dream? What are you creating? That's where it gets exciting, and that's where the work comes in. Because now you can build yeah. an outcome. Right. An outcome of what you want to do with all that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, because to me the. It, that inherently like even you're speaking about it it seems like those are the words i didn't put to it like that's what it feels like like truthfully because to me it's like it, cal and i have this conversation all the time the other day we worked a, literally a 15 hour day and it, that's been been just more and more and more and we're sitting there and we're editing after we got up at fucking six to hit the gym and then have to go film and then we come back and then we're editing and we're doing it all for pennies on the dollar because we know long term that's what's going to make us dollars on the penny. We're sitting there and we're like, it doesn't even fucking feel like work because of our vision. Right. And that's 
th- to me, that's the difference. Right. Like that's the difference. Um, but where I was originally starting with this was, you know, that success, however you want to define it, that freedom, however you want to define it. When I get there, I don't want to have to find my woman then because I don't want, I, I don't, I, it's like a disgust feeling of like finding some trophy wife when you're at that spot. Because it, to me, it's like a, how, there's no way you can prove your loyalty to anybody if you're, if you've only been with them since they've had seven figures. There's no way you can prove your loyalty to somebody if yeah. they don't have options. Well, you don't, I mean, it could happen. I mean, you could have a girl that just loves you for loves you and that, that all comes with it. So yeah. I mean, if it ends up happening that way, I mean, you know, she doesn't have to be a gold digger. I know. It just could be timing. But at the end of the day, it's like you have, you should put in writing what you would like to happen. I have that. And knowing it may not happen that way because mm-hmm. it may not be part of the master plan. And you can't get upset if it's not happening fast enough. Right. It's just not time. You know, I couldn't put a date on when Tammy was going to walk in my life. Mm-hmm. And it, and I never would have guessed it would have happened the way it did at all. So if it's the right person, the right time, it's like the universe is going to work in your favor and go, it's time. You're ready. Like the universe knows when you're ready. It's not going to happen until you're ready. You can't force it. If you force it, it's going to fail. Mm. You put it out there. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. This is what I feel. It may end up a little different, but it's going to happen. 100% will. Yeah. And you'll know it when it does. Mm-hmm. Now, what? Do you, th- this is the question that originally sparked this question that I, I just asked you, which was when you said, you know, you need someone, like when you look at Tammy, like she was with you through the grind and you need to see that. You know, what did, what does that look like? Cause to me, it's like the grind can be defined in any sort of way. Like, what does that, what did that look like for you? What do you mean? Cause you said, you know, one of the things that was so telling of this is my wife, this is somebody, this is my flavor ice cream. Like you're not dipping in anywhere else because of, you know, all these things. You said one of those pivotal things was the fact that she had been with you through the grind. What did you mean by that? So are you talking about? Us being loyal to each other and being all in with each other. Whatever the grind means for you. Well, there's two things I'm hearing. So me choosing to be loyal to my wife was a personal conversation I had with myself on what kind of man I want to be and the integrity and the outcome I want to have it be. And knowing that it's a slippery slope and life happens, but ultimately not fucking it up just because I just don't want to be that guy. And I don't want to do that to her and my kids. Mm Mm-hmm. And visiting, what if? So then you talk about the grind. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just life happens. So I think about when we first, you know, when we, we were going to get married and stay in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And um, just because it was comfortable, we were there. It's where we met. She had a job at a great hospital as a pediatric nurse. I had family there. It was just seemed like what we should do. And then we came up to Connecticut to meet family. And I saw how her family was and how they were. And, and I, I, in my gut, I, I wanted my kids to be born, raised up here. I'm from New York originally. So at the end of the trip, we're like, this is where we belong. And when we came up here, it wasn't easy. So it was really hard for me to get my license because mm-hmm. they didn't accept the national boards. They only had a state exam and they didn't want you in the state. So it was a grind. And I was working at a gym part time. We got pregnant two weeks after our honeymoon. We had a baby. We had Kylie at this time. Kylie was born um, in 2001. 9-11 hit a couple weeks after she was born. I mean, it was, and we were renting a house. And I was making really no money because I couldn't. I mean, I was, so I was more of an at-home dad with Kylie. And Tammy was working in the hospital up here. No shit. Yeah. So she was grinding for us. And I was at home with our first baby, you know, Tammy would pump milk and Kylie was tough, man. Like she'd wake up and cry and I'd put her on a bajorn and go walking for five miles all over Newington just to get her to sleep. And then I'd sit on the couch and try to chill and like let her sleep. And then the phone would ring or something would happen. It was, dude, it was a shit show. And you're not prepared for that. Wow. You know, and I was, I was making nothing. Tammy was supporting us. Holy shit. <clears throat> and, um, and then finally, I got my license, but we had no money. Uh-huh. So my first office was 400 square feet with a dirt parking lot. It was a dive, man. Wow. 
And I just had to have the energy to just people were going to come. And then one thing led to another, and I knew we're going we're gonna to make, we're going to do this. We're going to crush it. She was there all the way. And she worked and she, you know, and as, as we grew the practice and everything and she was able to back off of working, but not, she never, she always worked. She always supported. She always, I mean, there was, this, and then there's grinds and relationships and friends you make and relationships you have and you meet things through people through your kids and then they're, they're not really who you should be hanging out with and you got to have, you know, maybe she didn't agree and wanted to hang out with them. And I'm like, mm. they're a shit show. I don't want to hang out with them. And mm. that's a different kind of grind, you know? And then ultimately it's like, yeah, yeah you fall into a, there's so many things that happen that those waves that yeah. just come and some of those waves suck. You're going to get knocked down. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, you know, in order to succeed, you're going to fail and fall and get bruised up a lot. What a fucking story! That's crazy. I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know why. I just. I mean, I guess because like I, I, I obviously didn't know you in two thousand one. That's when I was fucking born. Yeah. But like the way I just, I don't know. I guess like I've just through ignorance just assumed like you've always just been successful chiropractic guy, and that's <laughs> Kylie was born into that. Wow! Wow! That's Dude. hilarious. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Holy shit! So what's the difference between so? Because. So when did things start to shift? Because like was was Brooke born into that as well, or was she born more into the wave? Or when did things start really? Yeah. So we. Uh, I'd, say, I'd say Jamie was more born into the mecca of it. Yeah, that's you know, what I was gonna say. You know, we bought our first house. Uh, ended up in Weathersfield. Uh huh. Market was hot. This family had five kids. Was moving, and. Uh, had this, we had a conversation with the father. He really liked me. It was the run to the neighborhood. Needed a lot of work. People didn't want it because it needed a lot of work. And he just texted. He called me. He's like, "Dude, I want I want you guys to have this house." And we ended up in it. And with Kylie as a baby, we stripped five layers of wallpaper. We, me and her, redid the entire place ourselves because we had no money. And uh, Kylie was crawling around, paint cans and sanders, and <sighs> dude, it was awesome. Like, now I'll write a check. Someone else will do it. Right. Back then, we had nothing. Yeah. And then Sierra was born. Yeah. Um, Sierra was born, and th four months into her life, my mother dies. And I, I had taken care of my mom, and I moved into Newington, and I didn't hear from her for a couple of days, was trying to call, but that wasn't uncommon. She never, so I had to climb in a window, and she was dead. Oh. She had been laying there for, like, three days. It's an ugly scene, bro. <sighs> and, uh. I was on the phone with Tammy as I was crawling through the window. Uh. She'll, she'll tell you, I blacked out, but she'll tell you exactly what I was saying and everything because me and my mom were tight. But Tammy supported me through that whole thing. I didn't miss a day of work. She organized all the funeral stuff. Um, she knew my mom was my heart and soul, so she just, I couldn't even tell you what she would say. She was just there. And then uh, – we had never really taken like a trip or anything. Didn't, you know, we, we were starting to make some money. So now Sierra's months old. And I said, uh, we need to take a break. I said, let's go away for a long weekend. And we booked the Ritz Carlton in Miami down in South Beach, which was way over my head. But I wanted something totally different. And I knew I was in an emotional state that I needed something totally different and I wanted my wife to have something nice and I brought my mother-in-law who had never been to a place like that when we were checking in. She needed to go to the bathroom. She asked the guy where the bathroom was. He had an earpiece in. He walked her to the bathroom. She's like, oh, I could find it. Went to the bathroom. He was waiting for her. Walked her back to the front desk. I said, she wakes up at five in the morning. They said, we'll have a pot of coffee at the door every morning at five in the morning. And then I was a big boy. So I was went in the pool one morning and I told the waitress, I want to drink Long Island iced teas. And whenever this glass is half full, fill it up. And my buddy, my best friend came, because now I was going through my little emotional release. And he hung out, and we went and sat in the hot tub. Bad idea. So now I'm walking up in the hallway, and my mother-in-law looks at me. My mother-in-law owned Elmer's, so a lot of people around here will know her. She hands me a towel, and I'm in the Ritz-Carlton with a giant cotton towel, and I puke right outside our door. They couldn't get the door open fast enough. And we just laughed. I'm like, all right, there's the little bitch, Steve. You got it out of your system now. <laughs> it's okay. 
<sighs> and that was it. We got on a plane. We went home and we just lived. It was just, that's life. Like, it's not going to fucking destroy me. Mom died. Like, now we got to work. I got two kids. And Tammy was just there. Like, it was, she didn't have to say too much. She said it at the right time. She took care of business. Like, we got, that's huge. When you could just, I look back now and it was just, we just got through it. You know, and then we had Brookie in the same house. And that's when things were busy and we didn't want this house it was too dangerous on a busy road and kids learning to ride a bike and I'm like, well, this isn't safe. And then we found some land around the corner and built a house. <clears throat> and, and, you know, it's just, you know, we've had miscarriages, bro. Yeah. We've had three. The third one was 30 weeks into pregnancy. We had to deliver a dead baby. You know, that shit will fuck you up, man. <sighs> and Tammy was a rock. I was a bitch. The uh, doctor didn't come in the room. Because he wasn't he he wasn't feeling well, and Tammy starts telling the the nurse, "Well, he needs to get adjusted. He needs to take care of better." She's coaching like how he needs to take better care of himself, and he needs to come see Steve and get a job. Like fuck this guy, I'll punch him in the throat. And uh, you know, if people haven't read my book, "Wake Up Humans," I was in a dark spot with that. When we lost Lily, and um, we were going on vacation a couple weeks later with again my best friend that met me at the Ritz Carlton, and. Uh, we went to the airport. It was Christmas time. It was like the day after Christmas. And they didn't have my ticket in the computer. And the airport was a zoo. And they, my wife's got the ticket in her hand. And they said, well, we don't have them. They overbooked the flight. And they said, you better get your family on the plane. Otherwise, they're going to miss it too. And they told me I wasn't going to have a flight for three days. So I went off. I lost my shit. The manager came out. Long story short, they got me out on the next flight the next morning at like 6 a.m., 7 a.m. So I went out and got shit-faced. I wanted to get into a fight or something. I was just mad. I was pissed off about losing the baby. I help all these people. How can this happen? God, this sucks. God, you suck. And um, my mother-in-law came and sat with me at the bar. So nothing stupid happened. I don't even think I went to sleep. Got a ride to the airport. Walk in the airport. Now, when we lost the baby, the night before, I woke up from a nightmare. And I was dreaming about Dick Hoyt. Do you know who Dick Hoyt is? If you go on YouTube and type in Team Hoyt, H-O-Y-T, I can only imagine, you'll see who Dick Hoyt is. He had a paraplegic son who he would run Ironmen with, and he would pull him behind a bo in a boat I've for two him. over two miles, put him on the front of the bike and ride 100 and whatever miles, and then run a marathon with this kid, and it made the kid feel alive. And I love this guy. Whenever I'd go through a tough time, i watch that video. When patients were bitching about life, I said, watch this video. Look what this guy's doing. Look at his little boy that he's taking care of. So he was a big role model of mine. So now I get dropped off at the airport the next morning. So I had that dream. I woke up that I was with Dick Hoyt at an event. I went back to his apartment, and I looked, and there was a little boy behind a door, and I said, is that your son? And these guys came running out with baseball bats and jumped on me, and I woke up screaming, and Tammy was awake. And she said, are you okay? I said, I just had a weird dream. It was horrible. And I go, what are you doing awake? She goes, I can't sleep. She said, go back to sleep. She goes, I go back to sleep. I wake up at 6.30. She goes, I think something's wrong. Long story short, we go to the hospital. We lose the baby. <sighs> Week later, we're at the airport. Whole thing happens. I go get drunk again. Um, Want to lash out, but it doesn't happen. God sends my mother-in-law to keep an eye on me. Walk in the airport, go to get a cup of coffee. And who comes walking next to me? Dick Hoyt. Comes walking up my right side. I look down at him, and I go, Dick fucking Hoyt. He goes, yeah, that's me. And I just started rambling. Like, bro, you're, you're amazing. Like, what you've done, and I've shown patients your videos, and blah, blah, blah. Had ordered my coffee. I, I, I was in a daze. I just turned it. I said, thank you for all you do, and I just walked away. And then I said, shit, I forgot my coffee. So I turn around, go back. I look off to my right. There's his son sitting in the big wheelchair with people around him talking to him. And I walk back, and Dick says, you're back. I said, I forgot my coffee. He said, I knew you'd be back. Grabbed the coffee, went. I had sunglasses on. I sat there and cried. Got on the plane, just wrote. And it was God's hand coming on my back and saying, you'll be okay. Stop. Like, don't be stupid and derail. Right? Because that's the knee-jerk reaction that I learned when I was younger. So it saved not only me, but a lot of people. I, I was at that point of like, dude, I'm tired of being such a goody guy and helping everybody. And now I lost this baby that I had to deliver and hold in the hospital because they said it's part of the healing process, which to this day I think is stupid. 
But then you fast forward to the, my baby Jamie, who said I was bored savage. <laughs> and when she's probably four or five years old in the back seat of the car, and I'm driving, Tammy's in the front seat, and Jamie starts telling us how she met the baby. Jamie was conceived exactly a year after we lost Lily. I was taking a shower. Tammy came in and says, uh, this is one year. This is the day we lost Lily. Started crying. We made love in the shower. She's pregnant. Jamie's born. Nine months later, I was born savage. It's crazy now that I'm telling it again. <coughs> Jamie's four or five in the back of the car. I met the baby. She's okay. Started talking about Lily. She'll tell you to this day. Yeah, I met her. She's okay. Absolutely insane, bro. So when you realize the messages life's going to send you, and I don't even know how we got on this topic. I don't know where this came from, but someone needs to hear it. Everything's going to be okay. You're going to still act stupid. I was trying to be stupid, but I had the right people around me to just kind of keep me. And then God stepped in with a big one with Dick Hoyt. What are the odds of running into him at the airport after that dream? And then I ran into him probably four or five other times. There was a time Kylie was doing a pageant at that airport, the hotel. Dick Hoyt was there. He was staying overnight because he was flying out for a marathon. And he saw me. I introduced him to my whole family. We took pictures together. It was insane. I have a note at my office that he wrote me. Because after I got home after that trip, I wrote him a note because I knew I was a little out of my mind explaining to him. And he wrote me a, a note back that's over the, the water cooler at my office. And it's, it's, how does that shit happen, bro? How do we get on that topic? I don't even know how that came up. Grind with Tammy. That's, that's yeah, what I Yeah, I mean, think about that stuff. We didn't know all this going into marriage. So yeah. what got us through the grind? Love, and we both have a lot of faith. And we know our roles. And she knows how to handle me. <laughs> When I go dark, she's she's great. Because you will. Man, that shit from your past will pop up. It's crazy. Damn. Oh, I can't think of a better place to wrap that up, but... It's got to be a happier message somewhere. <laughs> I guess. There's a, there's a closing tradition that I do with, uh -huh. uh, with any time where there's a new guest on the podcast. And it's a scenario. And the scenario is is you're on your deathbed, it's over, it's a wrap, and you find out you can't leave any podcast behind, you can't leave any book behind, you can't leave any conversation behind, no, no yellow notepad, nothing. There's nothing you can leave behind. The only thing people can learn from you is one word that you leave on your gravestone. What's the word? Love. That's it. Love is the answer, people. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Steve Judson, I'm sure this won't be the last time you're on the podcast, but I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you telling your story. And uh, wow, I mean, we went all over the place. We were been in here for over fucking almost two hours. But oh, shit, really? It's been this has been awesome. This has been fucking awesome. I appreciate you coming on for real. Thank Hello, you so bro. much. That was fun, man. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, peace, love, happiness, and stay handsome. <laughs> stay handsome. Stay handsome.